جئنا إلى الدنيا كي ندعو إلى الله لننشر الخير في الكون الذي حارا ونرسل الأطر من روض مدى الزاهي ويشرق السلم أنوارا وأنوارا جئنا إلى الدنيا كي ندعو إلى الله لننشر الخير في الكون الذي حارا ونرسل الأطر من روض مدى الزاهي ويشرق السيم أنوارا وأنوارا الله 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 أكبر الله 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 أكبر لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله Good evening. I want to welcome you to the Roger W. Hines Lecture for the 2006-2007 academic year. My name is Scotty McLennan, and I'm the Dean for Religious Life here at Stanford. A dozen years ago, the James Irvine Foundation established the Hines Lectures in Religion and Society. The series is intended to bring to the Stanford campus leading thinkers who examine the intersections and interactions of systems of belief and practice with human groups and societies. Past Heinz lecturers have included Elaine Pagels, Diana Eck, Bruce Lawrence, Karen Armstrong, and last year, the Dalai Lama. There's much to honor in Roger Hines and his legacy. A professor of psychology, then dean, then vice president at the University of Michigan, he came to the University of California at Berkeley where he served as chancellor from 1965 to 1971. Hines led the American Council on Education and then the Hewlett Foundation until his retirement in 1992. For many years, he lent his wisdom and energy to Stanford, having become a regular participant at its memorial church and a consultant to university leaders. We're delighted to honor him again this year with tonight's lecture. And I'm grateful to religious studies professor Robert Gregg, formerly the Dean for Religious Life, who worked closely with the Irvine Foundation to establish this lecture series, and in a moment, he will introduce this year's speaker. And with that, I would like to introduce Professor Robert Craig. Thanks, guys. Thanks to a splendid set of newspaper advertisements created by Debbie McDevitt of the Office of the Deans for Religious Life, you who have come here tonight already know a great deal about Professor Ehrman's celebrated and broadly read books. Perhaps some of you also know of his recorded lectures on early Christianity. I know from my days in North Carolina of the James Gray Distinguished Professorship, which he holds at UNC Chapel Hill. I have heard uh, stunning testimonies from those who have done their doctoral study with Bart Ehrman. While producing the kinds of close and technical stories that we in the Scholars Guild ponder and admire, Ehrman has also taken with complete seriousness his vo vocation as a teacher of undergraduate students and in recent years of the wider public. He makes fascinating texts and traditions in early Christianity accessible through his characteristic clarity of explanation and argument. Alterations in the earliest manuscripts of New Testament writings and the special field of text criticism have occupied Ehrman since his own graduate student days, and we are very fortunate to have him here as our Heinz lecturer to give us his latest take on some of these issues. His lecture title, as you know, Misquoting Jesus, Scribes Who Altered the Scripture and Readers Who May Never Know. That's not you. Please welcome Bart Ehrman. 
Well, thank you very uh, much for that uh, generous uh, introduction, and, and you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be to be with you all uh, this evening. So, uh, I, uh, uh, as Bob was pointing out, I teach at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, which, uh, as uh, you all know, is in the uh, it's the buckle of the Bible Belt, uh, which uh, creates uh, certain uh, interesting moments uh, in teaching uh, historical approaches toward early Christianity and the New Testament. Uh, this, this last year, I was teaching my course on the New Testament, uh, so I, I had a class uh, about 360 students uh, in it, and uh, I, I decided to do something this last year that I had never done before. I, I began my class uh, by asking students the following question. I said, how many of you in here would agree with the proposition that the Bible is the inspired word of God? Boom! The entire room raises its hand. All right, good, great. Now, uh, how many of you have read the Da Vinci Code, I asked? Boom! The entire room raises its hand. Oh, good, okay. Now, how many of you have read the entire Bible? Scattered hands. <laughs> I said, all right. Now, I'm not telling you that I think God wrote the Bible. You're telling me that you think God wrote the Bible. I can see why you might want to read a book by Dan Brown. <laughs> I mean, if God wrote a book, <laughs> wouldn't you want to see what he had to say? <laughs> Uh, it's just one of the mysteries of living in the South. Well, uh, the uh, the Bible the Bible is the most uh, widely purchased, most thoroughly revered, and probably most broadly misunderstood book in the history of human civilization. One of the things that's misunderstood, at least by uh, my 19-year-old students at Chapel Hill, is that when we're reading the Bible, we're not actually reading the uh, words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, we're reading translations from the Greek language in which these books were written. And something is always lost in translation. And not only that, but we're not reading translations of the originals of these books, because we don't have the originals of these books or of any of the other books of the New Testament. What we have are copies made centuries later, many of them many, many centuries later. These thousands of copies that we have are all different from one another in lots of little ways and sometimes in big ways. There are places where we don't know what the authors of the New Testament originally wrote. Now, for some Christians, that's not a problem because they don't have a high view of Scripture. For others, it's a very big problem. What does it mean to say that God inspired the words of the, of the text if we don't have the words? Moreover, why should one think that God performed the miracle of inspiring the words of the Bible if he didn't perform the miracle of preserving the words of the Bible? If he meant to give us his very words, why didn't he make sure we received them? The problem of not having the originals of the New Testament, though, is a problem for everyone, not simply for those who believe that the Bible was inspired by God. For all of us, I think, the Bible is the most important book in the history of Western civilization. It continues to be cited in public debates over gay rights, abortion, over whether to go to war with foreign countries, over how to organize and run our society. But how do we interpret the New Testament? It's hard to know what the words of the New Testament mean if we don't know what the words were. And so in this uh, lecture, I'll be talking about not knowing what the words were and uh, wh what, we might, uh, what we might know about the originals of the New Testament, how they got lost, and how possibly they might be reconstructed. So let me begin by talking about, uh, on a fairly basic level, how it is that we got the books of the New Testament. The books of the New Testament were all written in Greek. They were all written in the first century of uh, the Common Era, uh, they were written by Greek-speaking Christians who wanted to share with their community their views of Jesus, of the faith, uh, uh, of, of what to believe and how to behave. So an author like Mark, the author of our first gospel, sat down and wrote out one day his gospel about Jesus. 
Now, we don't know where Mark actually lived. Some scholars have thought that Mark maybe lived in Rome. So let's say he lived in Rome. Mark writes his book. Well, how does this book get in, into circulation? The problem is we're dealing with an age in which uh, there were no Xerox machines. Uh, there wasn't desktop publishing yet, no PDF files. Uh, in fact, uh, there wasn't carbon paper. How did people copy, how did people get copies of books? Well, in the ancient world, the only way to get a copy of a book was to copy it by hand. One page, one sentence, one word, one letter at a time. Mark makes his book, and somebody in his community wants another copy of it. And so that person either makes a copy himself or has somebody else make a copy for him. Now, part of the problem is that in the ancient world uh, at this time period in the Roman Empire, probably something like 90% of the population was illiterate, couldn't read or write. So not anybody could just make a copy. And, and most people who could write couldn't write very well. And so somebody makes a copy. We don't, know who it, we don't know who it was who made the first copy. We don't know if this person was competent or incompetent, but he made a copy. And probably, if he made a copy of this book by hand, one page, one sentence, one, one word, one letter at a time, he made mistakes. Now, my students sometimes have difficulty believing that people make mistakes when they copy things by hand. And so I tell them, well, you, know, you sit down tonight and copy the Gospel of Mark and see how you do. Uh, well, in fact, they'll make mistakes. Now, here... Here we have a problem created because we have the second copy of Mark that is also put in circulation and somebody wants a copy of Mark and so they copy the copy, but the copy has mistakes in it. And so the next person who copies it copies the mistakes thinking that they're the original wording. And the second person also makes mistakes of his own. And so he not only reproduces the mistakes of his predecessor, he introduces his own mistakes. And then another person comes along and copies that copy, making the mistakes of both of his predecessors and creating mistakes of his own. And then that book gets put, put in. And pretty soon you've got copies around the city of Rome that are all different from one another. Now, a visitor comes to Rome from Ephesus, and uh, they have a church back in Ephesus, too, and they want a copy of this gospel, and so he takes his copy, makes a copy, takes it back to Ephesus. And then that copy gets copied, and that copy gets copied, and that copy gets copied. Then somebody comes from Smyrna, and they want a copy. And so, and so it goes for year after year after year. We don't have a copy of Mark until around the year 200 about 150 years after Mark was originally written. So not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies, or the copies of 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 the copies, et cetera, et cetera. Mistakes were made en route, and these mistakes were replicated. Now, the only way a mistake gets corrected is if you're copying a copy of Mark, and you come across a sentence that you're pretty sure is wrong because it doesn't make sense, and you try and correct it. And so you, uh, you, you, you correct it to say something other than what it says. The problem is there's no guarantee that you will correct the mistake correctly, right? You might correct the mistake incorrectly, in which case you've got three forms of the text, the original text, the mistake, and the mistake and correction of the mistake. And so it goes on for year after year, decade after decade. The originals end up getting lost. They get lost, they're either, they're either worn out of existence or people figure, well, we don't need this, I've got a brand new copy of it, and so they throw it away. And all of, the, all of the books of the New Testament, all 27 books, experience the same fate. And so that is the situation we're dealing with. This is not a situation that's unique to the New Testament. This is a situation that we find for every book from the ancient world. Every ancient book has this problem. The problem is exacerbated with the New Testament simply because the New Testament has come to be revered as scripture and also because, as it turns out, we have more copies of the New Testament than of any other book uh, from the ancient world. That would seem like a good thing, but it also means that we have more mistakes for the New Testament than for any other book. And so uh, the uh, abundance of evidence we have creates an abundance of problems. Let me talk about the surviving copies that we do have. Uh, first, give you a sense of the numbers uh, of books that we're talking about. New Testament was originally written in Greek, and at last count we had over 5,700 copies of the New Testament uh, in the Greek language in which it was originally written. Now, when I say we have 5,700 copies, I don't mean that we have complete copies of all the books from beginning to end. 
What I mean is we have either complete copies or fragmentary copies. Some of these fragmentary copies are very small little fragments found in trash heaps in Egypt uh, where the rest of the book was destroyed, and we just have a little scrap. Uh, so we have from little scraps to enormous tomes that are in, in uh, medieval libraries. We have 5,700 copies in Greek, and we have copies in other languages because as Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire, people translated the New Testament into other languages, such as Latin. Uh, we have something like 10,000 copies of the Bible in, in the New Testament in Latin, uh, in Coptic, the ancient Egyptian language, in Syriac, in, uh, in Georgian, in Armenian, in Old Church Slavonic, etc., etc. We have all sorts of copies in all sorts of languages. Uh, these, uh, these copies uh, can be compared with one another, and when you compare these copies with one another, there are lots of mistakes in them because no two of these copies are exactly alike in their wording. How old are these copies that we have? Well, uh, the oldest copy that we have of any book of the New Testament is actually a little fragment that was discovered in Egypt. This fragment is um, about the size of a credit card, and it's written on both front and back. Uh, that's significant, by the way, that it's written on both front and back because it tells you that this copy actually came from a book uh, like we have books today where you've got pages written on front and back as opposed to a scroll. Christians early on preferred writing their, their scriptures in books rather than in scrolls. That made uh, these books different from other books throughout the, the Roman world. This little credit card sized scrap that we have is called P52. <laughs> it's called P52 because it's written on papyrus. So P, papyrus is an ancient writing material, and it's called P52 because it was the 52nd papyrus that was discovered and, and, and categorized, classified, um, um, cataloged. So uh, this little scrap has a few lines on it from John chapter 18. It's the passage where Jesus is talking to Pontius Pilate uh, in his trial before Pilate, where Pilate says, what is, tr what is truth? That line. Uh, so that's that. It's written on, and it's written both front and back. Now the thing is, if you have a little scrap like that, and it's written on the front and the back, and you know what passage it comes from, uh, then you can actually do some interesting things because you can figure out, even though you don't have a complete line on this page, you can figure out where this thing was on the page, and if you've got. Um, if you do it right, if you figure out, if you've got it one margin, you can figure out how many letters were in each line, and you can figure out how many lines must have been on the page in order to get from this part to that part. See what I'm saying? So you can actually reconstruct how long the page was, and then you can calculate how many pages were in this manuscript, because how many pages would it take with this many letters in it to, to create the Gospel of John? And so this one scrap can tell you how long the manuscript was. Uh, so there are people who do this for a living, <laughs> so it turns out. So this is the oldest scrap. How old is it? This scrap, P52, uh, is usually dated to the first half of the second century. The way they date uh, ancient manuscripts is actually on the basis of a handwriting analysis. Uh, the, the, the science of this is called paleography. Paleo meaning ancient, graphy meaning writing, ancient writing. So the study of ancient writing is called paleography. And there, there are scholars who are paleographers who can date manuscripts within about 50 years of their production. Uh, the, the, the way the, the science works is that handwriting in the ancient world before there was the invention of printing changed slowly over time. So people made letters in certain distinctive ways depending on when they lived. Uh, and so if you are familiar with how handwriting was in different periods of history, then you can determine when, when a manuscript was written. That's, that's the science of paleography. And you can, a good paleographer can get within about 50 years. So this thing, and you need a 50-year gap because some scribe who's copying a manuscript when he's 70 uh, probably is writing the same way he did when he learned how to write when he was 20. And so you need a 50-year 50-year gap. So this thing is dated to around 125 plus or minus 25 years. Well, that's pretty early. This is from the Gospel of John. This, is, this, this little piece was probably written about 30 or 40 years after John itself had been produced. So that, that's pretty good. We don't get a complete copy of the Gospel of John uh, until, again, around the year 200. Uh, but we do have this, this little scrap. Most of the manuscripts we have are not anywhere near this early, though. Uh, we start getting full manuscripts at the beginning of the 3rd century, around the year 200, 150, 170 years after Jesus' death. 
Uh, these are about 120 years after most of these books had been written. Uh, and we still don't start getting numerous manuscripts until the 7th, 8th, or 9th centuries. Uh, and then we start getting lots of them because then you've got monasteries where monks are spending their days copying manuscripts. Uh, and we have, we have a lot of their manuscripts. And so 5,700 manuscripts, some of them going back into the second century, none of them being uh, the originals or within uh, a few, even within a few years of the originals. So with, with all of these differences, with all, with all of these manuscripts, how many differences are there? Throughout the Middle Ages, it appears that the scholars didn't realize that there was a problem of not having the original text, or very few scholars uh, realized that this was a problem. Even the scribes copying the text, they, they sometimes would realize there are differences in the manuscripts they're copying, but they didn't make a very big deal about it. The first time somebody made a really big deal about this was uh, exactly 300 years ago this year, in the year 1707. There was a, there was a scholar, uh, named John Mill at Oxford. I, I think he's unrelated to the Victorian John Stuart Mill. Uh, th this John Mill was a, uh, was a scholar of, of the Bible. And he had spent 30 years looking at manuscripts of the, uh, of the New Testament. Now, this is obviously after the invention of printing, and printers have to decide what text they're going to print. And the problem is they've got manuscripts that have differences among them. And so how does the printer decide which manuscript to print? Well, it's a problem. That, that's when they started realizing that this was an issue. Well, John Mill wanted to produce a printed edition of the Greek New Testament. He spent 30 years looking at the manuscripts available to him. He had available to him 100 manuscripts, approximately 100 manuscripts. And he printed up his edition of the Greek New Testament in which he'd give, he'd give a verse, and then at the bottom of the page he would indicate the places where the manuscripts differed from one another. For, for that verse. To the shock and dismay of many of his readers, when John Mill produced his edition of the Greek New Testament and included an apparatus at the bottom of the page that cited 30,000 places where the manuscripts differed from one another. 30,000 places where there were manuscript variations among the manuscripts that he had discovered. And the striking thing is John Mill didn't give all of the differences he found. He only cited the differences that he thought were significant. Some of his detractors claimed that John Mill was working to render the text of Scripture uncertain. His supporters pointed out that he didn't create these differences. <laughs> he simply noticed that they exist. So what do we know today about the numbers of mistakes in our manuscripts? Well, Mill looked at 100 manuscripts, and now we have 5,700 manuscripts. Nobody knows how many differences there are among the manuscripts. Uh, that we now have, because nobody yet, even with the development of computer technologies, nobody has been able to add up all of the differences. Sometimes uh, scholars guess that there may be a couple hundred thousand differences. Some people say 300,000. Some say 400,000. Uh, there are different guesses. The way I usually put it to my students is in, in comparative terms. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. Well, this obviously creates a problem. If you want to know what Mark actually said, and all you've got are copies of Mark that are hundreds of years later that have so many differences in them, how can you possibly reconstruct it? Well, that, that, that is a problem. <laughs> now, having said that we have these hundreds of thousands of differences, I, I want to, to emphasize a particular point, which is most of these differences that we have in our manuscripts are completely insignificant, unimportant, and don't matter for a thing. Many of these differences in the manuscripts are so unimportant that you can't replicate them in translation. Okay? In other words, you, like they changed the word order uh, in Greek where you would have to translate the same way no matter what the Greek word order is. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter very much. By far, the vast majority of these hundreds of thousands of differences are significant for nothing more than showing that scribes in antiquity could spell no better than my students can today. <laughs> and scribes, of course, didn't have spell check. <laughs> uh, scribes, in fact, didn't even have dictionaries. And scribe, m many scribes didn't care how they spelled anything. Sometimes you'll be reading a manuscript and there'll be the same word that occurs, say, three times within a couple of lines, and the scribe will spell the same word three different ways. <laughs> 
He just doesn't care how the word is spelled. Well, so, you know, you've got, you've got lots and lots of those kinds of changes. And what do they matter for? They don't matter at all. So having said there are all these hundreds of thousands of differences, I want to stress that most of them don't matter for very much. Some of these, some of these changes, the ones that don't matter basically are accidental mistakes. Scribes were uh, sometimes tired or sleepy, uh, sometimes they were distracted, sometimes they were inept or unqualified, and they made mistakes. They would leave out a word, they'd leave out a, a verse, sometimes they'd leave out a page. Uh, they, they just made mistakes sometimes. One of the common mistakes uh, scribes is actually kind of interesting. Uh, there, sometimes, you know, in the New Testament, you'll have a, a saying where you'll have two lines that end with the same words. Like Jesus in, John, in Luke chapter 12 says that whoever confesses me before people will be confessed before the angels of heaven. And whoever denies me before people will be denied before the angels of heaven. So you've got two lines that end with the words before the angels of heaven. And what scribes sometimes would do is they'd copy down the words before the angels of heaven on the first occurrence. And then, you know, they'd copy it down. Then their eye would go back to the page and their eye would alight on the second occurrence of the same words. Thinking that that's what they had just copied, they'd go then to the next line and start copying there, and as a result, they would leave out the intervening line. See how that works? That kind of, that kind of phenomenon is a, it's an, where your eye skips from one line to another. It's called parablepsis. Parablepsis. And when you have words that end the line the same way, that, that's known as homoioteluton. <laughs> so this kind of mistake is called parablepsis occasioned by homoioteluton. <laughs> It's on my final exam at Chapel Hill. <laughs> Probably the most egregious mistake in any manuscript of the New Testament, uh, one of my favorites, is uh, in a manuscript that's manuscript 109. It's 109 because it's, it's written on parchment and it, uh, you know, le uh, animal skin instead of papyrus. And it was uh, the 109th manuscript that was, uh, that was uh, cataloged. This is a 10th century manuscript that was written by a scribe who wasn't paying attention. Uh, and this, uh, this scribe was uh, copying the Gospel of Luke. Now, the Gospel of Luke uh, is one of the two Gospels in the New Testament that has a genealogy of Jesus. Genealogies usually aren't the favorite reading of my students at Chapel Hill. And I think probably it wasn't the favorite reading of this guy because he wasn't really paying attention to what he was doing. But, you know, in Luke's genealogy... Luke's genealogy is actually fairly interesting because uh, in, in Math, Matthew's the other gospel that gives the genealogy of Jesus, and it traces Jesus' line all the way back to Abraham, the father of the Jews, in Matthew. Luke doesn't stop there. Luke keeps going. Luke traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam, as in Adam and Eve. <laughs> This is a fantastic genealogy. <laughs> I've got an aunt who's a genealogist who's traced my family, you know, back to the Mayflower. <laughs> the Mayflower, <laughs> Adam and Eve. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, Jesus is supposedly the son of Joseph, who's the son of so and so, the son of so and so, the son of so and so, who's the son of uh, David, son of Jesse, son of so and so, goes all the way back. You know, Isaac, son of Abraham, so on the way back to, uh, you know, Seth, son of Adam, who's the son of God. Okay, this genealogy it goes all the way back. So the scribe of manuscript 109 is copying a manuscript that evidently gave the genealogy in two columns, two columns. But the second column didn't go to the bottom of the page. It only went part way down, the second column. So the first column, second column, part way down. And the scribe apparently didn't realize that this genealogy was in two columns. And so he copied across the columns instead of copying one column, then the other column, leading to some very interesting results. <laughs> As it turns out, Adam isn't the first human being. There's, there, there was a man named Pharees, who's the father of the human race. And, and as it turns out, God is the son of Aram. <laughs> so, so it happens. <laughs> These kinds of mistakes are just pure accidental mistakes that, you know, scribes mess up in places. There are other kinds of mistakes. Uh, 
that um, are uh, what, what I think are probably intentional mistakes. I, I, call, I differentiate between accidental mistakes where scribes just slip up and intentional mistakes where it looks like scribes are actually trying to change the text. Now, I don't know for sure that scribes are trying to change the text. I don't have any scribes around to interrogate about the matter. But there are some changes that don't look like they could possibly simply be a slip of the pen. And there are others that are debatable, whether they're a slip of the pen or, or not. But let me give you a couple of examples, and you'll see that some of these look like scribes maybe wanted to change the text. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple for instances. In Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark, uh, we read at the very beginning, that uh, we read, as was written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face to prepare your way for you. Okay, this is in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before you. This is a very interesting passage because the passage that's quoted is not Isaiah. When it says in Isaiah the prophet and then gives the quotation, the passage quoted is actually Exodus. So it's interesting that in uh, the later manuscripts of uh, Mark's gospel, the text is changed. Not this, so that it no longer says, in Isaiah, as is written in Isaiah the prophet. Now it says, as is written in the prophets. You see, getting rid of the problem that, in fact, this isn't a quotation from Isaiah. Right? See, so that, that, I mean, maybe that's a slip of the pen, but it looks to me like somebody saw that this could be taken as a mistake and they changed it as a result. Or give you, give you a second example. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, we have the only story of Jesus as a boy in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus is a 12 year old, and we're told that he and his family have taken a trip to Jerusalem to celebrate a festival, probably the Passover festival. It is, it is a peculiar story because the, uh, the, they, they celebrate this festival, and then the family gets back and goes back in the caravan back home, and three days later they realize Jesus isn't with them. <laughs> I mean, you might think they would have checked ahead of time, but they, he's not there. And so they go back to Jerusalem to try and find him. And on the third day, his mother finds him in the temple. And this isn't an accident, by the way, that it's on the third day, right? This is, this is a foreshadowing for Luke of what's going to happen at the resurrection narrative, where on the third day, Jesus will rise from the dead. Well, so on the third day, his mother finds him in the temple, uh, and there's 12-year-old Jesus talking to the leaders of, of the, the Jews and discussing with them matters of the law. And Mary uh, is not pleased, and she sees Jesus finally after tracking him down for three days, and she says, Son, why have you done this? Your father and I have been looking all over for you. Now, when scribes copied this, they, they were taken aback. Your father and I? But Joseph wasn't his father, right? Jesus was born of a virgin. So it doesn't make sense for Mary to say, your father and I have been looking all over for you. And so there are changes in the manuscripts. Some manuscripts simply say, Joseph and I have been looking all over for you. Some manuscripts say, we have been looking all over for you. But somebody's changing the, man changing the text because it could be read as a problem. And so they got, they got rid of the problem. I'll give you a third example. Uh, this example uh, is in one of Jesus' uh, discourses in the New Testament in uh, Matthew chapter 24, in which Jesus is talking about what's going to happen at the end of time. Uh, <laughs> this passage actually was very important. I, 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 feel, I feel a tangent coming on here, by the way. <laughs> this passage was very important uh, when I moved to uh, Chapel Hill in 1988. Uh, this, Bob, you had been gone for a year at this time. In 1988, there was a big furor in North Carolina. Uh, there, were, there, was a, there were Christian groups who thought that the end of the world was going to happen in 1988. Uh, that Jesus was going to come back and take everybody out of the world who, had, who were his followers. Uh, that's the rapture, right? When everybody, the rapture and Jesus comes back, takes people out of the world, and then the, all hell breaks out on earth for seven years, and then the end comes, right? So, so there was a guy who had written a book based on this passage I'm going to talk about in a second. A guy had written this book uh, that was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Occur in 1988, this, this book was in two million copies. I had students whose parents believed it and literally sold the farm 
They, they thought that, that Jesus was going to come back in 1988. And so I just showed up in North Carolina, kind of blissfully ignorant of these things. And, uh, uh, you know, I moved from New Jersey, <laughs> where such things we're not worried about. And we, um, uh, but this guy, this guy named Edgar Weissenet, he, he, was, a, he was a Nassau engineer who uh, had, had studied the Bible and come up with 88 reasons why the rapture is going to occur in 1988. And one of the reasons involves this passage I'm going to talk about. Je- Jesus tells this passage, the, the disciples want to know when's the end going to come. And Jesus tells them, learn the parable of the fig tree. When the fig tree puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So too, when these things take place, you know that the end is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. So uh, Edgar Weissen, this is one of Edgar Weissen's 88 reasons. So the way it works is this. Uh, what is Israel in the Bible? Israel is sometimes represented as a fig tree. Well, when the fig tree puts forth its leaves, you know that the end is near. Well, okay, so if, if the fig tree is Israel, when does, when does the fig tree put forth its leaves? Well, the, the fig tree lies dormant over the winter, and then when springtime comes, it comes back to life. When does Israel come back to life? 1948. That's when Israel comes back to life, becomes a nation again. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. How long is a generation in the Bible? Forty years. 1948 plus 40, bingo, 1988. This was one of the 88 reasons. Now, somebody pointed out to Edgar Weiss in it that Jesus in the same passage points out that no one knows the day or the hour when the end will come. Uh, when Weissenden had said that it was going to come during the week of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, in September. And so they said, but, you know, Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour. And Weissman was completely unfazed. He said, I don't know the day or the hour. I just know the week. <laughs> All right. So, so th- this passage actually throughout Christian history has been, been important because people have always been trying to figure out when the end's going to come. So uh, in this passage, Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour, not the angels of heaven, nor even the Son but the Father alone. Okay, Matthew 24, 36. Scribes copying that found it uh, to be a peculiar thing to say, though. Not even the Son knows when the end is going to come. I mean, surely the Son of God is all-knowing. Isn't he omniscient? And so how do scribes deal with the problem? They deal with the problem by getting rid of the phrase. And so in later manuscripts, the phrase, not even the Son, is taken out so that now Jesus doesn't claim to be ignorant about when the end is going to come. So that strikes me as probably an intentional sort of change. All right, so you you get accidental changes and you get intentional changes. I want to talk about some of the big differences that you get in some of our manuscripts just, to, just so you can get an idea of, of, uh, of how significant this problem can be. Probably the uh, most familiar story in the New Testament Gospels is the story of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. I'm pretty sure this is the best known story of the Gospels because it's in all the Hollywood movies. I mean, if, if you do a movie about Jesus, you've got to have Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. It's so much a requirement that even Mel Gibson, who uh, the Passion of the Christ, which is about Jesus' last hours, has to get this in, and so he has a flashback showing this, this, this scene of uh, Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. So the way the story works, it's, it's found only in the Gospel of John, chapter 7 and 8. And Jesus is teaching the temple, and the Jewish leaders bring... Br- they drag this woman in front of him, and they say, she's been caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says we're to stone someone like this. What do you say? See, this is setting a trap for Jesus, because if Jesus says, well, yeah, stone her, then he's violating his teachings of love and mercy. But if he says, no, forgive her, then he's breaking the law of Moses. So what's it going to be? Well, uh, Jesus has his way of kind of getting out of these traps, as you know, if you've you read the New Testament. So what he does in this case is he, he stoops down and he starts writing on the ground. And he looks up and he says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. Stoops back down, starts writing again. And one by one, feeling guilt of their own sins, they, they begin to leave until Jesus looks up again and there's no one left. 
And he says to the woman, is there no one left to condemn you? And she says, no, Lord, no one. Jesus replies, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Um, there is a textual variant in a now lost manuscript, which when um, Jesus, uh, about this, this line about let the one, when he says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. And this one textual variant, uh, it indicates that a stone came flying out from the crowd, nails the woman in the head. And Jesus says, Mom, sometimes you really tick me off. I made that up. <laughs> this, this story, uh, th this beautiful story, this powerful story, uh, which uh, has two terrific lines uh, from Jesus in it, this story was not originally in the Gospel of John. This is a story that was added to the Gospel of John by later scribes. How do I know that? We have a number of early manuscripts of the Gospel of John. This story is not found in any of our early or best manuscripts of the Gospel of John. The Greek authors who wrote commentaries on the Gospel of John over the centuries don't mention this story until the 10th century, a thousand years after the days of Jesus. Uh, the writing style of this story, if you read it in Greek, the writing style is a completely different writing style from the writing style of the rest of the Gospel of John. As a result, scholars have known for years that this story did not originally belong in the Gospel of John. Well, why is it in our English Bibles then? Probably what happened was some scribe had heard this story. They'd heard the story and they decided that it illustrated some of the teachings in John chapter 7. And so they, they wrote out the story in a margin. A second scribe came along, saw the story in the margin, and thought it belonged in the text, and then wrote his manuscript by putting the story in the text. Another scribe comes along and copies that manuscript, and that manuscript gets copied, and so on until it becomes part of the textual tradition. And it's these later manuscripts that were used by the translators of the King James Bible in 1611 so that the story came into English uh, through the King James Bible. So um, this story, however, uh, is not a story that was originally in the New Testament. So people sometimes ask me, well, are there any changes that are significant in the New Testament? Well, yeah, well, this strikes me as a rather significant change, that the story of the woman taken in adultery wasn't originally there. Or consider a second instance of another big difference, the Gospel of Mark. Mark is probably my favorite gospel because it's so subtle and understated in places, and it, it, it says things that you don't expect. Uh, and nowhere is this more true than in the ending of Mark's gospel. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is uh, put on trial, and he's crucified, he's dead, he's buried. And on the third day, the women go to the tomb. The tomb is empty, and Jesus is not in it. There's some man in there. And the man tells the women that Jesus is not here. He's been raised from the dead. You, he tells the women, go tell the disciples that he will meet them in Galilee. And then it says the women fled from the tomb and they didn't say anything to anyone for they were afraid. Period. That's where it ends. That's the end of the Gospel of Mark. And you think, ay, 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 how could it end there? The, I mean, they're told to tell the disciples, but they don't tell anybody. Didn't the disciples ever learn? Didn't they go to Galilee? Didn't they see Jesus? How could that be the end of the story? And that's exactly the reaction the scribes had. They got to that ending, they said, ay, 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 how could it end there? And scribes then decided it couldn't add there, and so they added 12 verses. So that in your English Bibles today, you'll find 12 more verses after that, chapter, uh, after chapter 16, verse 8. And often they'll be in double brackets because the translators are t will tell you in a footnote, these verses weren't originally in here. These were added by later scribes. In these verses, uh, in these added verses, the scribes added later, uh, but we know they're added later because they're not in the earliest and best manuscripts. The writing style is different from the rest of the Gospel of Mark. And in fact, there are, uh, there are inconsistencies between this ending and the, the verses that precede it. So this is clearly an addition to the Gospel of Mark. In these final verses, according, according to these final verses, the women do go tell the disciples. The disciples do go to Galilee. They do meet Jesus there. And Jesus then tells them that they're to make the disciples of all the nations. And people become his disciples will be able to speak in foreign languages that they previously didn't know. They'll be able to handle deadly snakes. And they'll be able to drink poison and it won't harm them. <laughs> 
These are the verses that the Appalachian snake handlers in my part of the world use to base their liturgical practices on. I've always thought that sometime on the, on, you know, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, somebody should point out, well, you know, actually those verses aren't in the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, Mark actually ends with women not saying anything to anyone, for they were afraid. Somebody added the last 12. Well, let me give you a couple more examples of some differences that strike me as big. One, one that I, I think is really quite interesting that scholars debate. The, the first two I gave you, scholars don't debate very much. Almost everybody agrees that they weren't originally there. But there, there's an interesting change in another story in Mark that there's, there are, there's a lot of debate about among scholars. It's, it's the story in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus heals a leper. And the way the story works is that Jesus is, uh, is walking along and a leper comes up to him. And the leper says to him, so I mean, this is, you know, this guy with leprosy. And he comes up to him and he says, uh, Lord, if you're, you're willing, you're able to, to cleanse me. And in most manuscripts, it says that Jesus felt compassion for the man. And he reached out his hand and he said, I am willing. And he healed him. But in several ancient manuscripts, it says something different. In these other manuscripts, instead of saying Jesus felt compassion for the man, it says, and Jesus got angry and reached out his hand and said, I am willing, be cleansed. Getting angry. Now, scholars have to debate which is the text that Mark originally wrote and which is the text that's been changed by a scribe. And one, one piece of logic that, that scholars have used over the years is this. Ask yourself, which text is a scribe more likely to have created out of the other? Is a scribe likely to have taken the text that says Jesus felt compassion and changed it to say Jesus got angry? Or is a scribe likely to have found the text that said Jesus got angry and to change it to say Jesus felt compassion? Well, if you put it like that, then well, the latter is more, more likely something a scribe would have changed. And so this criterion ends up sounding kind of backwards, but the way the criterion works is that the reading that's the most difficult to understand is probably the original one. Okay? The more difficult reading is to be preferred. And so that's one reason for thinking that, in fact, this text originally said Jesus got angry, and there are actually a whole host of reasons for thinking that's what the text said. The next, the next step, then, is to ask, well, what's he angry about? In other words, you, to, to try and figure out what the text means. But you can't know what the text means unless you know what the text says. You see? So you've got to establish the words first, and that's what people who are textual critics do. They try and decide what the words originally were. Let me give you one other example, and then I'm going to stop and take, uh, take any questions that you have. Um, there's another uh, quite moving passage in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, which uh, is, is also well known. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scene in which Jesus is being, uh, being crucified. And uh, Luke is interesting in the, in the scene of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, Luke is interesting at the scene of the crucifixion because uh, it's unlike what happens in... Luke is unlike what happens in Mark's Gospel, the, the story of, of the crucifixion. In Mark's... Just to, just to illustrate this for a second. In Mark's Gospel which is the first gospel, you have a very distinct uh, portrayal of Jesus going to his crucifixion, a portrayal that is filled with pathos and, and agony. Uh, people don't realize this, that Mark's portrayal is very different from Luke's portrayal. And the reason they don't see that there are differences is because of the way that people read the gospels. Uh, the, the way people typically read the Gospels, if they read the Gospels at all, but if, the, if they read the Gospels, the, the normal way of reading a Gospel is that you start at the beginning and you read to the end. So, okay, you're going to read the Gospel. You start with Matthew. You start with the first verse, chapter 1, verse 1, and you, you start reading and you get to the end. You go from top to bottom. Then you read Mark. Start at the beginning, go to the end, top to bottom, and it sounds a lot like Matthew. Same stories, a lot of the same words, sounds very similar. Then you read Luke, top to bottom, sounds exactly the same. Not exactly, it's different, but it, you know, it's basically the same thing. They sound alike. And then you read John, well, that's different, but, well, you know, in essence, it's, it's not that far off. So they all sound basically the same because you read them from top to bottom, or you read them vertically. The way to see differences in the Gospels is to read them not vertically, but to read them horizontally where you read a story in Matthew and you look at the same story in Mark and compare the, compare the two stories. When you do that, you start finding enormous differences. Uh, people, you know, there are all these debates about whether there are discrepancies in the Bible. But if you want to find discrepancies in the Bible, all you have to do is 
is read the text horizontally. I give, them, I give this as an assignment to my students all the time. Uh, I give them the path. I say, take the resurrection accounts. What really happened at the resurrection? Depends which author you read. And so I have them list what happens in Matthew, what happens in Mark, what happens in Luke, what happens in John, and, uh, and compare the list. And it's actually quite striking when you do this with the resurrection narratives. Because, well, who, who is it that goes to the tomb? Is it Mary Magdalene by herself or Mary with other women? If other women, how many other women? And what are their names? It depends which gospel you read. What do they find there? Is the stone rolled away already or is it not rolled away uh, already? It depends which gospel you read. What do they, who do they see there? Do they see a man there as in Mark? Do they see two men there as in Luke? Or do they see an angel as in Matthew? Depends which gospel you read. What are they told? Are they told to tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee, or are they told to tell the disciples to stay in Jerusalem? Do they go tell the disciples? It depends whether you read Mark or whether you read Matthew and Luke. If they do tell the disciples, what do the disciples do? Do they go to Galilee, or do they stay in Jerusalem? It depends which gospel you read. I mean, you just, you just go down the line, and, it, and, it's, and it's different. And that's how you get if you, if you read these stories against each other. Well, if you do that in the story of the crucifixion in Mark and Luke, you come up with very, very different portrayals. The significance of that, the significance of that, is not just that. Okay, it's, well, there are discrepancies. Yeah, there are discrepancies, but that isn't the point. The point is that if you want to know what Mark has to say, you have to read Mark, and not pretend he's saying the same thing as Luke, because they're different. And so Mark has to stand on its own as a literary production. In Mark's gospel, when Jesus is being crucified, uh, in fact, it's a, it's a very gripping scene. In Mark's gospel, Jesus doesn't say anything uh, while he's being led to the place of crucifixion. While he's being crucified, he's completely silent. When he's hanging on the cross, he's mocked by uh, the Jewish leaders by the people who are passing by in front of him, he's mocked by both robbers in Mark's gospel. Jesus doesn't say anything until the end in Mark's gospel. At the end, he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. That's it. That's Mark. A very, very powerful and gripping. And, but people don't realize that this, because people think Jesus said all sorts of other things on the cross. Well, why do they think that? Because they've read Matthew, and they've read Luke, and they've read John, and they end up with the seven last words of the dying Jesus, which are found in not one of the Gospels, but by smashing all of the Gospels together into one big, big Gospel. Now, it's perfectly legitimate to do that if you want to do that. If you want to read the Gospels and smash them all together so they're all right and they're all saying the same thing, but you have to realize that if you're doing that, you're writing your own Gospel. And you're making it say something that's different from any of the Gospels of the New Testament. Okay, so I mean, that's, that's the effect of doing that. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is not silent. He's not silent on the way to be crucified. He sees women weeping for him, and he, and he turns to them and he says, uh, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the fate that's to befall you. He's more concerned about these women than himself in Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, he's not quiet while he's uh, being nailed to the cross. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. While he's hanging on the cross, he actually has an intelligent conversation with one of the robbers. The one guy accuses, the one guy maligns Jesus. The other robber says to the other person to, to, to be quiet because Jesus hasn't done anything to deserve this. And then he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him in Luke's gospel. Not in Mark, but in Luke, he knows exactly what's happening to him. He knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise, and this guy's going to be next to him. And at the end, the most telling thing of all is that Jesus, instead of crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't say that in Luke. What he says is, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he dies. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is completely in control of the situation. He knows what's going on. He knows why it's going on, unlike Mark, where he seems to be in doubt. This, passage, this verse about, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, is a very interesting verse. In early Christianity, this verse was interpreted not as a prayer of forgiveness for the Romans who were crucifying him. It was interpreted as a prayer for the Jews who had turn Jesus over to the authorities. Jesus is asking for forgiveness for the Jewish people in the interpretation of the early Christian interpreters of the passage. 
That makes it striking that in some manuscripts from uh, the early dec- from the from the early years, this prayer is omitted by some scribes. Why would scribes take that lovely verse out? Well, it should be obvious why they took it out. They took it out because they interpreted it as a prayer of forgiveness for Jews, and these scribes didn't think God had ever forgiven the Jews. In the 2nd and 3rd centuries, Christians started saying that Jews are guilty for the killing of Christ, and that, in fact, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in the year 70 by the Roman armies was a punishment by God given to the Jewish people for rejecting their own Messiah. In the 2nd and 3rd centuries, we have Christians who are saying that Jesus was God, so that when Jews, they would say, when Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus, uh, we have some authors saying Jews are guilty of deicide. Jews have killed God, and God held them responsible. What's a scribe who thinks that going to do with his prayer of forgiveness? He's going to take it out, and that's exactly what happens. Some of our early manuscripts are missing the prayer. They're missing it because scribes have changed it for reasons of their own. These are some of the big differences uh, that you can find in the New Testament manuscripts, and there are all sorts of differences that you find. Some are related to theological disputes of early Christianity, where scribes have changed the text to make it coincide more closely with their own theological views. Some of these changes have to do with relationships of Christians and Jews. Some of these changes have to do with Christian understandings of women. Uh, There continue to be debates today in churches, Christian churches, about whether women should have leadership roles. Well, these uh, these debates often hinge on verses that have been changed by scribes. You can guess which way scribes changed these verses. In the second and third centuries, when when women's roles were being suppressed, uh, all of a sudden manuscripts start showing up in which women are told to be silent in the churches. Uh, This is the sort of change that that, uh, scribes made. The textual critic is somebody who tries to deal with this phenomenon of manuscripts that have so many changes in them. There are actually two things that a textual critic critic does. One thing that is, uh, of course, primary importance is to figure out what an author actually wrote. Because you can't interpret an author, whether you're talking about Plato or Aristophanes or Homer or Mark or Matthew or Luke or John, you can't interpret what an author said unless you, you can't interpret what he said unless you know what he said. You've got to have his words, and so textual critics try to reconstruct to the best of their ability what an author actually wrote. A textual critic also, though, is interested in knowing why the text got changed. Why did scribes change the text? I mean, you know, it's interesting to see that sometimes it fell asleep. But beyond that, what kind of theological motivations were there for changing the text? What kind of ideological influence was, were affecting these scribes? When we know more of that kind of information, we're better able to understand both the scribes and their own historical context as people living in the early centuries, especially the early centuries, a time period about which we have very little information about Christianity otherwise. Thank you very much.